Okay, sure. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Gibson Museum's Fireside Chats, and I'm glad they don't have the fire going today. <laughs> We're here to listen to the expertise of Dr. John Parker, who is not only a longtime resident of Lake County and the person who inspired and motivated the state of California to establish Anderson Marsh State Historic Park, but he's also the first vice president of the Lake County Historical Society. John has created in the Gibson Museum the beautiful uh, history, um, the Native American portion of the history that is on display. And he is going to share with us historic bottles and what they can tell us about the past. So on with Reverend, Reverend. Reverend. <laughs> 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 Sorry. 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 Doctor John Parker. Yes. <laughs> I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> uh, I've been doing archaeology for 41 years, and I uh, got started when I was um, about your age. Mine. And uh, I grew up in San Jose, and I liked the old bottles. So I joined the San Jose Antique Bottle Collectors Association, which still exists today. And we used to go out to this old city corporation yard, and the city would allow us to dig the whole club. So we'd be like 30 of us out there digging. And uh, we used to shoot off a cannon, and we'd all run and stake out a six foot square and start digging. You know, burr, burr. Pretty soon, about half an hour later, you didn't see anybody, just dirt <laughs> flying. Up, you know. And then there'd be a hoop and a holler over here and a hoop and a holler. Oh, I got some. Oh, I got some. And uh, so that's kind of how I got started as an archaeologist. But the, the cool thing about bottles, I mean, they're pretty. You know, they're nice different colors. Some of them have writing on them. But as I was digging through this garbage, about this far down, there was a layer of broken plate glass that covered the whole dump. And then there was more cultural stuff under the layer of broken plate glass. It's about this thick. So I'm kind of scratching my head and I'm wondering, what the heck is this layer of broken plate glass? The 1906 earthquake broke every plate glass window in the city of San Jose. And they hauled all of that off the streets, out to this big corporation yard, and dumped it. So I thought, oh, there's more to this than just a cute bottle. I know now that everything above that layer is after 1906, and everything below that layer is before 1906. So when I got to college, I thought, yeah, I'm going to take an archaeology class just for the fun of it. And uh, so now I have a PhD in archaeology. I spent 14 years in college. <laughs> um, just because I have a PhD, don't, don't get all freaked out about it. I mean, if you can get through the eighth grade, you can get a PhD. <laughs> there, the work is no more difficult, there's just more of it. That's all. Um, right, yeah. Everybody in this room has a PhD in something. Whatever it is you spent most of your life doing, that's what you have your PhD in. I spent most of my life sitting in a classroom with 30 other people looking at a blackboard. And so I have a PhD in classroom sitting. <laughs> but, um, but I learned about a lot of stuff while I was doing that. Cultural things, historic things. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And be sure, anytime, if you have a question about anything, feel free to ask. Um, the stuff I'm going to talk about is, well, it's, it's about garbage. Mm -hmm. this, this is what archaeologists do. I spent 14 years in college and got three degrees to learn how to interpret people's garbage. That's what I do for a living. So when we're working on an archaeological site, we look for certain types of deposits, um, so, some sort of feature that will tell us something about the people that lived there who built the site, 
or kind of activities they were doing. Within the features, maybe it's a trash pit, maybe it's an old buried outhouse, maybe it's a well, foundation footing. Within those features, we look for artifacts that will tell us what activities were taking place. It's kind of like CSI, only we're coming on the crime scene 100 years later or 300 years later, or in the case of prehistoric site, 5,000 years later. And all of these things that we find go together to put together, the, they're all individual pieces of a puzzle. And when we put all these pieces together, we actually can reconstruct what took place way back when. So we look for ceramics, metal, bone, shell, and glass. Now today, I'm only going to talk about glass. If you want to hear about bone or shell or ceramics, you'll have to come to a different talk, <laughs> which I haven't developed yet. Excuse me. <laughs> So, we're going to learn how to determine the age of a piece of glass. We're going to learn how to determine its use and what it can tell us about the person who bought and used it. There's a guy. There's another guy. These are both people from Lake County. And there's a piece of glass. You know what that is? It's a lantern. I'm going to talk about this little piece of glass later on in the talk, but I just wanted to throw it up here so that you would go, oh my goodness, what the hell is that? <laughs> okay, how old is the bottle? Bottles have been around forever. Uh, the earliest known archaeological evidence of a blown glass bottle is from Egypt about 3,500 years ago. These were free-blown bottles, no moles and uh, no seams, and they just blew them and then took a little tool and made the neck, the lip on the top, and uh, that was pretty good. Now, then they came along with an idea called a dip mold, and they actually blew that glob of glass into a mold. It could be a square mold, it could be a round mold. It usually tapered a little bit toward the base to make it easy to pull the blown bottle out of it. And uh, once it was out of the bottle, uh, the mold, a, a blob of glass was stuck on the top to uh, <coughs> make the neck or the lip. This is actually a dip mold bottle. And when you pulled it out of the mold, the molten glass would actually stick a little bit to the sides of the mold and pull down. You see those oh. little feet here? Yes. That's actually the glass elongating as it was pulled out of the mold. I will pass this around. This is from probably 1830. Do not drop it. <laughs> What's the mold made of? The molds are usually made of, of uh, clay. What's its value? <laughs> from a scientific point of view, it's very valuable as long as I know where it came from, because that will tell me what activities were taking place there. I can't tell you economic values of these things, because to an archaeologist, it has no economic value. It only has scientific value. <laughs> these things were gradually phased out by the 1870s and were replaced by hinge mold bottles. <laughs> Came from the East Coast. We don't have anything that old here on the West Coast, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a picture right there. Kind of like this. Not that's not this one. This is a different one. I don't know who did. Hinge molds. Oh, there we go. Through. <clears throat> they started using these molds in 1809 but they were the most popular from 1840 all the way up to the time that machines started making bottles, about 1912. And some of them were just straight hinge things that plopped together. Some of them were hinges on a box that had a little post that stuck up in the middle. Um, sometimes, here's an actual a real one here. This one's made out of steel. A post bottom or a cup. This is a cupped bottom mold. 
And here are some guys making hinge mold bottles. We've got two hinge molds, one here and one here. This guy is getting glass from the glass furnace over here. This one's in the process of blowing glass into that hinge mold. This guy up here is going to grab that bottle when it comes out and hang on to it and put a neck or lip on it. How does he tell me about the liquid, the glass? Does it work? Oh, the glass is in this furnace over here. Yes, and how yeah. does it get from there? Into the hinge mold? So that little rod that you see yes. that he has is a blowpipe and he sticks that into the furnace and gets a glob of glass on it. Okay. And right now he has the glob of glass and he's kind of rolling it back and forth so it doesn't plop onto the floor. And as soon as this guy pulls that out of there, he's, this guy's gonna open that mold and he's gonna put his blob of glass in there, <sighs> blow it out into the mold, and bada bing bada boom, there you go. <laughs> Turn molds, now when you put a glass in one of these hinge molds, it's going to have a seam. But mm -hmm. for really fancy glass, you don't want this ugly old seam. So they decided that if they put it in the mold and blew it, and then twisted it before they pulled it out, it would wipe away the seam. And if you look closely at these, you can actually see little striations going around the bottle that were created from that twisting motion. That's a twist or a turn mold bottle. Here's another one. They usually don't have any writing. Well, they can't have any writing on the side because they're twisting it. They usually don't have any writing on the bottom either. But some guy did invent a mold where the bottom would rotate. So you could actually have a twist mold bottle with writing on the bottom. <coughs> these were popular in 1880, and they made these until bottom machines took over. This uh, is kind of hard to see, but this is a plate that goes into a plate mold. So it's, it's like a hinge mold, but it's got a little recess in it so that you can put a plate with uh, some words on it. So if you were a pharmacist and you wanted all the bottles, all the prescription bottles from your pharmacy to have your pharmacy's name and address on there. You could call the bottle manufacturer, they could make one of these plates, put it in there. And these were being used by 1840 and were popular through the 1860s. Um, I don't know if I have a plate mold bottle here or not. Let me see. Shores. I don't have a plate mold bottle. Is this plate? No, that's not a plate mold. It would have a square actually outline around the lettering that you could actually see where the plate was sitting. Bottle making machines uh, invented in the 1880s but not really put into use into uh, 1893. This is a bottle making machine to make milk bottles. The bottle making machines actually sucked the glass up into the mold, snipped it off, turned it over, and th that was for the base of the bottle, and then they had another mold for the neck and the top. And it was a pretty complex <coughs> process. Um, 1903, Michael Owens, originally you had to actually put the glass into the mold yourself. It wouldn't automatically, you know, do it. Um, but then in 1903, Michael Owens patented a fully automatic bottle making machine, <coughs> which actually had an automatic feeder <coughs> back here. There's a continuous tank of, gla of uh, molten glass <coughs> that was fed into the machine. This is actually what his 1904-1906 machine looked like. And it's, uh, <laughs> don't ask me how. <coughs> There's actually a video online of this machine working. And at the end of the talk, I'm gonna give you the link to it if you'd like to go and see. <coughs> 
the automatic bottle machine working. It's virtually impossible to distinguish between a semi-automatic <coughs> machine bottle and a fully automatic machine bottle. <coughs> The way you can tell whether it was machine made or not is on the bottom, you'll see a little bit of a scar, a kind of a circular scar. That's when the glass blob came up into the bottle, an automatic sniffer snipped it off. And that's, that's what created that scar. Wow. <coughs> so whether it was hand blown or machine made, that's one way to tell how old it is. This one, this was machine made. <laughs> but how about color? Some of these colors are gorgeous. These are all the different chemicals that are used to make different colors of glass. The natural color of glass is this right here, kind of pale blue, pale green. Glass is made of sand and what else? Aqua, sand, silica. Um, I don't know. I'm not a chemist. I'm an archaeologist. Doesn't the color change with exposure to sunlight, like electrical? <coughs> I'm getting there. Oh, it depends on what's in. Ruby red was the most popular during uh, the 1840s to 1880s. Black glass, <coughs> which is not really black, it's just a very, very dark green. Where's that, uh, ah, that, <coughs> that case blown bottle. If you look back there, you can see how dark green it is. It actually looks kind of black if, if the light's not shining through it. That would be considered black glass. That was popular up until about 1880. Melt glass, you know that white, you can't see through it. Wipe your ponds, cold cream is, yeah. Yes. Those are made from about 1870 and about 1920. They still make these colors today, but these were when they were the most popular. So in the 1880s, glass makers <coughs> wanted clear glass so that the person buying the product could see it clearly through the, through the bottle. And uh, manganese dioxide, worked really good at making, taking the blueness or the green out of the glass and making it clear. Unfortunately, it reacts to sunlight and over time <laughs> will turn the glass purple. <clears throat> Here's an example. This is actually a salt dish, which was absolutely clear when it was first made. Manganese dioxide. Here's another one. This is a chili powder turned purple. Did you, yeah. did you find all of these bottles? Um, some of them I bought, but most of them I found. Yeah. yeah, I was quite a collector back in high school and junior high. Um, in fact, I proposed to my first wife, I, one that San Jose Antique Bottle Collectors Group, we were out yeah. digging in that yeah. lot, and I was down in the bottom of a hole, and I had hid the, the ring in my pocket. You know, I kept, hey, I got something, and everybody's looking up, what'd you get, what'd you get, you know, and it was the ring. So. <laughs> I proposed to my first wife in a dump. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I like purple. Manganese dioxide had a problem, though. It didn't work well in the automatic, in the tanks, in the open tanks that were used for the bottle machines. Um, another problem with manganese dioxide is that the end of World War I, it was in short supply because it was used to make steel. So bottle makers needed something else to make clear glass. So they started, by 1914, they switched to selenium <coughs> and arsenic. And uh, which also makes a nice clear bottle. Let's see, is this it? But selenium and arsenic also react to sunlight 
and turn the bottle glass kind of a straw colored yellow or a little honey colored yellow. You can't really see it through the main body, but if you look at the edge, you can see there's a little yellow tinge to that. <clears throat> so they started doing that in 1914. They stopped doing that in 1930s. So if you got a purple glass bottle, It was made with manganese dioxide between 1880 and 1914. If you've got a bottle that's got that yellowness, you know it was made between 1940 and the mid-1930s. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Next, they changed over time also. Between 1830 and 1885, a blob of glass was slapped onto the top of the bottle and tooled into the shape that they needed for the neck. Let's see, I've got one here somewhere. That, that looks Maybe? like a blob. Is that a blob? It looks like a blob. That looks like a blob. <laughs> I think that's a blob. I don't know. It's not a very good example of a blob. Maybe this one. Nope, that's not a What about the one next to it with all the writing? With all the writing? This one? Yeah. Is that a blob? Mm, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I got a blob. I thought, oh yes, this one's definitely a blob. There we go. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Beer and soda was carbonated, and they were so afraid that the glass might break with the pressure that they started making soda bottles like this. <laughs> They're called torpedoes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and this was blown, and, uh, and they actually took a separate blob of glass and plopped it on there, and, and you can actually see where the blob of glass is connected to the rest of the bottle. <laughs> So that's a blob <coughs> that's called an applied neck. A second piece of glass is applied to the top. Here's a, here's a picture of a blob. Here's another one. You can see the original glass yeah. bottle and then the yeah. second chunk of glass was stuck on there. <coughs> In 1870 they invented a special tool which would take the actual neck part of the bottle and make the the top, the neck, the uh, the finish. They call this they call this part the finish. Mm -hmm. Would make the finish without adding a blob of glass. So here's one that's a applied blob, and here's one where just the the neck of the original bottle coming out was used with that tool to to finish it off. And uh, just about all of these are are finished that way. Here's a nice one. This is a uh, what is this? It says. It's a natural cathartic water. <laughs> Do not feed it to your pets. <clears throat> okay. So, next can tell you how old it is. Is it a blob top or was it a tool, hand tool? How about closures? Some of these things we still use today, some of them you've probably never seen before. The earliest closures were just plain corks, which work really good unless you've got something under pressure. Right? If you've got something under pressure, then you need something special. And Henry Putnam in 1859 patented this little gizmo right here, which went around the neck of the bottle and held that cork in place. Mm -hmm. And that was real exciting until the 1870s, 80s, and 90s when they invented these bale stoppers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one that I really like is this one right here, the Hutchinson Spring Stopper developed in 1879, <clears throat> it actually seals the bottle from the inside. The pressure of the soda or whatever holds it up there. And when you want to drink it, you hit that thing, it goes down in, and the spring opens up right in the neck so it stays open for you. <coughs> Here's a soda bottle. It has part of a Hutchinson spring stopper still inside of it. <laughs> And all you have to do is reach in and grab that spring, pull up, it reseals. Wow. 
and keeps its busyness for the next time. <laughs> so these are all different types of what's called lightning stoppers, the bail uh, stoppers. And uh, here's, a, here's a nice example of a bail stopper, a lightning stopper. Everybody see this? Yes. Okay. So stoppers are good. Oh, it is. Yeah. Some of these stoppers are really neat. These, uh, this one right here is made out of ceramics. And the beer companies would actually put their logo on the top of that. <coughs> a lot of times the bottle is broken and gone, but you'll find the little stoppers. Mm -hmm. And you can tell what company it was. Uh, most of you recognize this type of stopper, invented by William Painter in 1892. <coughs> Unfortunately, there was an economic recession in 1892. So these, used, these weren't really started, they didn't start making these really until about 1894. But the uh, crown cap is still with us and uh, very much alive. <coughs> Beginning in 1894. So canning. I've got a lot of canning jars. I got some. I got some up here, I'll pass some of these around. Canning jars. You couldn't just go into a store and buy stuff in a can. First of all, there weren't stores. <laughs> Secondly, no one has worked, was making stuff in cans. Uh, and even when cans came out, they were so messy and crazy that people kept making, you know, we took, I canned a whole bunch of apples last year for apple pies. I've been making apple pies all winter. Uh, everybody still can. No, not everybody. Who, who still can? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah, oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, see, see, some of us old timers are still set in our way. <laughs> From the 1830s to the 1850s, there were all different kinds of caps and seals for canning jars. Some of them screwed little things on, some of them were little bales that came over, glass mostly on the top. <clears throat> And then in 1858, this guy by the name of John Mason patented, patented this new screw top. His patent was not for the cap. His patent was for this right here. That shoulder and these screws. That was his patent because what that did was it allowed a zinc cap to seal on the shoulder. That's where the seal is, right there on the shoulder. And that was pretty cool. And zinc lids were made until World War II and there was a shortage of zinc. And that's when they switched over to those tin uh, plated things that we have now, the kind of the rings, you know, with the... Yeah. <coughs> Unfortunately, Zinc reacts with the food and gives you a nasty metallic taste when you're eating it. So this other guy came along, Lewis Boyd, in 1869 and patented a glass liner for the inside of the zinc cap. See that glass liner there? Is that exciting? Yeah. Right. He actually had a fruit jar company too, the Boyd Fruit Jar Company. But uh, so there you go. You got a glass liner, you got the zinc cap, and we were using these all the way up until the end of World War II. Yeah. Why zinc in the first place? I think zinc was just an easy metal to make. <coughs> I think we had a lot of that resource here in the United States. Tin is not something we had a whole lot of. So, writing and maker's marks. Another way to tell how old a bottle is. Everybody asleep yet? <laughs> okay, just check. So here's a nice bottle. I'm going to pass this one around. This actually is a, came out of an archaeological excavation that I did, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. <clears throat> but before 1906, most of these patent medicines, like this Warner Safe kidney and liver cure bottle, had the word <laughs> cure because it would cure anything that ailed you. <clears throat> 
Well, in 1906, the U.S. government passed the Pure Food and Drug Act. And part of that law said that you could no longer use the word cure because that was false advertising. So the companies that were making these things immediately went to their glass makers and they said, change that word cure, and I want you to put remedy. So that very same bottle comes out the next year saying Warner Safe Kidney and Liver Remedy. Here's one after 1906. This is uh, Chamberlain's Cough Remedy. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll find an old hand-blown bottle that actually has the uh, the contents, you know, the amount of contents in it. Because in 1913, an amendment to, was made to that law which said they then had to put the uh, amount that is in the bottle on the bottle. So, yeah, volume marks. So you'll find a bottle with a little says, you know, th three ounces or 10 ounces or 32 ounces or whatever. Now, some booze bottles already had that. They were already saying, you know, a pint, half a pint, half gallon. Or, I think I've got one here. Where's my booze bottle? Ooh, yeah, here's a nice one. Wright and Taylor Distilleries. Full quart, it says right on there. Yeah, full quart. That's a whole party right there. But that was done before 1913. Um, it was uh, because the booze companies wanted you to know, yeah, you were getting that. The full court. <laughs> then we had prohibition, and everything went to pot. And uh, no, no pun intended. But after after <laughs> prohibition, <clears throat> the federal government passed a law saying that all booze bottles had to have embossed on them. Federal law forbids the sale or reuse of this bottle. Hmm. So between 1935 and 1964, if you get a booze bottle, it will have this marked on it. And because uh, you weren't supposed to remake, you weren't supposed to make bathtub gin and put it in a, you know, a booze bottle and resell it as, you know, real gin. So, uh, also most bottle makers from way back started putting marks on their bottles indicating what, you know, a maker's mark. You know, whether it was the Owens Glass Company or whatever. <clears throat> and... There is a book out there called Bottle Maker's Marks. This is one of my Bibles. I paid big bucks for this book on eBay. And somebody had actually stolen it from the Albuquerque Public Library. <laughs> it's a non-circulating book. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. It says surplus property, city of Albuquerque. Okay. It wasn't stolen, they were getting rid of it. <laughs> but this actually has every U.S. bottle maker's mark in it. <laughs> every one. So if you've got a bottle that's got a maker's mark on the bottom, oh. you can look it up. Let me see if I got that. These are just U.S. makers. You have to go to some other country to get the other makers' marks. <laughs> what else we got here? Uh -huh. So, that's how to tell how the bottle is. Now, we got to get to why. Why are these things important? Who gives a poop about a bunch of old bottles? You know, except for the fact that they're cute and they might look good on your fireplace mantle. You know, that's like, doesn't really tell you anything about who used it or what, you know, when it was used, what it was used for. Um, a few years ago, Cheyenne and I did an archeological project in San Luis Obispo behind where this 1888 all girls convent school was located. 
And behind this convent school, they had an outhouse. And this is what it looked like before we started digging it. It was just a dark stained soil, about 12 feet by about 4 feet. And here we are digging it out. We actually excavated it in three sections. Now, before you get all freaked out, it's more than 100 years old. It's just dirt, okay? It's just dirt. Sure. <laughs> but it had everything in it from the daily life at an all-girls convent school. And it was a boarding school, so they had a, uh, you know, a place where they had their meals and everything. The nuns had uh, a convent next to the school. And the nuns actually ran an infirmary for women. So you had all these activities going on, and we had this outhouse. And I thought, well, okay, because of the historic documents, I knew that the nun's convent was on this side of the outhouse, and the dining hall was on that side of the outhouse, <laughs> and the school was like straight ahead. Humans are lazy. You all know that, <laughs> right? Because you're all human. So if you have a bag of garbage from the kitchen, that you need to get rid of, you're going to take it to the closest hole in the ground that you can get to to dump it in, unless someone's occupying that hole, in which case you might take it to another hole. Mm -hmm. If you're in the convent and you have some garbage you need to get rid of, you're going to take it to the closest hole. So that's why I decided to excavate this in three sections. Now, a bottle collector wouldn't give a shit. <laughs> they would just be in there, oh, well, oh, just, oh yeah, I'm going to take this home, put it on my fireplace. No. But an archaeologist wants to know what's going on here. This is what it looked like after we emptied it. Everything came out, everything was screened, everything was washed, and we're in the process of cataloging the glass items here. Um, some of the bottles were food bottles. Canning jars, of course, mustard, olive oil, spice shakers, jelly tumblers, you know, sometimes you can do that, you can actually buy little mugs with jam in them at Grocery Outlet, you ever get one of those? They make nice little mugs after you finish eating the jam. And pickle and preserve wear, this is an interesting thing, if you look at the neck here, it's actually ground off. This was hand blown in a mold when they snapped it off the blow rod they ground that top so it would make a nice seal when the cap was put on. So then we looked at where these bottles came from. And you can see over here, this is close to the dining hall. We had the olive oil caster bottles. You know those casters that have all the different mm -hmm. condiments? Mm -hmm. You know, you, they roll, yeah. Um, and we had pickles, preserved, jelly, candy jars, all there over there by the dining hall. Mm by the by the convent, they had canning jars, pickle preserve wear and mustard jars. So, you know, and they had a an infirmary for women. So some of the women were actually eating there in the convent. Stop it. We're having my butt. And then and then right in the middle we had just about everything. Because sometimes those holes were Okay, so we're here we are at an all-girls convent school. <laughs> now this I understand. Sacramental the sacraments. Yes, in fact, I actually was able to come up with a, uh, there was a published document by one of the local winemakers about how much wine he ended up delivering to this convent <laughs> and how he thought it was a little, you know, strange. <laughs> But then we have this other stuff here, whiskeys. <clears throat> what is that? Flasks, picnics, fl a shot, shot glass? Shoe <clears throat> fly. Oh, soda bottles. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, soda bottle. This is a beer bottle, actually. Um, so we're digging this stuff and we're popping this stuff out of the ground along with some poker chips. <laughs> and this project is on the grounds of the current Catholic school, Catholic prep high school. And the father that runs that school is coming out and looking at what we're doing every once in a while, and he sees these 
you know, I'm saying, yeah, look at this cool, isn't this cool? And he says, you're not going to put that in your report, are you? <laughs> We've already got enough rumors going on around here. <clears throat> I said, you know what? I have to. This is what actually happened here. When I finished that excavation and we did all the analysis, it turned out all of these booze bottles, except for the wine, were found in the part of the outhouse closest to the dining hall and laundry facility. And I suspect the cook, the Chinese laundry man, and the maintenance guy would sit after work and, you know, play cards and have a little whiskey. So if you've got an infirmary, you're going to have people with prescription drugs, right? These are all prescription bottles. And if you were a, let's see, I've got a nice prescription bottle, a couple of them actually. Here's one. Here's one from uh, Fort Bragg. And usually they have the name of the pharmacy on there. <clears throat> which is really neat for an archaeologist. This one was completely full. I didn't taste it. I had no idea what that was. All prescription bottles. But the neat thing about prescription bottles is because they have the name and location of the pharmacy, I can actually put together a chart showing here's all the people in this infirmary. Where did they come from? They brought their prescriptions with them. This was in San Luis Obispo, so most of them were San Luis, local San Luis prescription bottles. But we had people from San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Bernardino, Petaluma, Minneapolis that showed up in San Luis Obispo and ended up in this infirmary with their prescriptions. See how much more information you can get from a bottle? Yeah. What about their ailments? All of these different patent medicines. I've got a whole book here that just deals with historic medicine bottles. Every type of historic patent medicine is listed in here. What its contents were, what percent of alcohol was in it, and other nasty drugs, and what it was used for. So I could tell that <laughs> this particular medication was for everything. <laughs> this was what for uh, urinary problems, hair, kidney and liver, eyes, uh, female complications, cuts and scrapes, pain, stomach acid, dandruff, weakness, consumption, tuberculosis, right? Head diseases, uh, colds basically, and constipation. <laughs> so not only do I have on the graph here how many bottles we found that dealt with each of these ailments, I also graphed how many different types of medications, how many drugs were tried to deal with these ailments, and how many bottles of those drugs were used. So this gave me a really good idea of not only of where the women in that infirmary came from, but what they were suffering from. Turns out that most of these constipation bottles were not in the part of the outhouse closest to the infirmary. Those were in the part of the outhouse where the kids were eating. So the cook probably was not a very good cook. <laughs> this, <laughs> this stuff, <clears throat> this stuff was called uh, California fig syrup. <laughs> And here's one right here. This one actually we found just a few weeks ago up at Hoburg's. <laughs> I'll pass it around. California fig syrup, nature's pleasant laxative, mostly for kids that have a problem. And they had a lot of that problem at this particular all girls convent school. But we had Mexican Mustang liniment, we had uh, Dr. Pierce's Golden Medical Discovery, all kinds of medicine, medicine bottles to treat all kinds of ailments. Um, it's really interesting when you think about, you know, the women's movement in the uh, 1920s. You have the, uh, you know, and they're out marching uh, for women's rights and, and all of that. And, and, and the prohibition movement, you know, they're marching against drinking and, and then after a hard day marching they would go home and they would grab themselves a Lashes Bitters bottle 
which was 40% alcohol, yeah. and down it to, uh, to ease their pains from marching all day. It's interesting the multiple diseases. So we've got food bottles, we've got drink bottles, we've got medicine bottles. How about personal hygiene? <coughs> Check that out. Does that make you want to have some cologne on? <laughs> yes, absolutely it does. And we found lots. Back in the 1880s, you had a bath maybe once a week. If you were lucky, once a week you'd have a bath. You had a lot of odors you needed to take care of with some nice cologne. And maybe, uh, you know, some perfume. So we were able to actually figure out what companies, what companies' perfume bottles were the most <coughs> prominent in the 1880s. Hoyt's German Cologne was very popular. Uh, also, Florida water. Florida water was very popular. There's a Florida water bottle right there. And I do archaeology and I like to study history, but I like to actually experience history, not just study it. It turns out they still make Florida water. So, I haven't had a bath for a week. <laughs> I'm going to pass this around. You are welcome to imbibe in Florida water that has been made since the 1860s. And they're still the same company. Murray and Lehman still makes Florida water. And when you, when that comes around and you give it a little smell, see if you can figure out what it smells like. There's a, there's a mouth. <laughs> there actually is a, a cologne right now that, that you can get which has the same smell as Florida water. Personal dormant and cosmetic, uh, shoe polish bottles. We a lot of shoe I think I got a shoe polish bottle here. Hey, sweetie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nope, that's a drug company. Ah, here we go. Whitmore, Boston. French gloss. Oh, look. Whitmore Brothers, Boston. Shoe polish. So, we looked at the shoe polish bottles. There were a whole bunch of different ones being used. Now, the nuns had to make sure that their shoes were nice and shiny black all the time. How about cosmetics? Different cosmetic bottles. How many of them were there? Were? Uh, this is pretty cool. Rubifoam for the teeth. We got some of that here. Here it is, Rubifoam for the teeth. Got to brush your teeth every day. Yeah. Vaseline. I like Sozodont. <laughs> the names of this stuff are great. Sozodont for the teeth. So it was a school. So guess what? We get ink bottles. <coughs> and we get the things that go in the desk for the ink. And... Uh, Carter's, Carter's ink, yeah, ink bottles. Here's a, a little brown hand-blown ink bottle from the 1880s. Here's a one that's natural glass color. And uh, Carter's ink was the most popular, followed by Sanford, Sanborn, Thomas. Huh. In the business. And then you got special purple, purpose bottles. This was a, a convent school. So we actually did find a broken bottom of a holy water flask, which was pretty amazing. We were getting a lot of uh, rosary beads and crosses and, it, and hearts because it, the Immaculate Heart nuns were running this convent school. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is kind of neat, a, a drip-proof cream pitcher. And you can see it's all taped together. 99% of what we find is broken. So we go through the broken stuff and we piece it together. Some of it's for decoration. This was an incredible vase. All hand blown and the, and the glass wrapped around and then pinched while it was still molten. 
was amazing. Toys. This is actually a little formula bottle, a little baby bottle, just a little guy like this for a kid that was playing with her dolls. So that was uh, example number one. Example number two, this was underneath a downtown city block, also San Luis Obispo. And we find these things. What is this? They're not very big, only about this long. Yeah, a lot of people call these opium bottles. Opium actually comes in tins about like this, made out of copper or brass. These are, these are pill bottles. They're, they had the powders in them, uh, medical powders. They're Chinese, Chinese medical bottles. What's this? This one really stumped me. Um, took me a long time to figure that out. There are other parts of it. <coughs> Here's a part of it. Oh. Oh. A butter churn. Okay. That, the thing on the left is about this tall and about that big around. When I first saw the broken pieces of it, I thought, oh, that's, that's a, a kerosene lamp chimney or something, you know. But then it all came together like that. It was kind of funny. Here's another part to it. <coughs> and if you put all these parts together, they look like that. And then that chimney thing goes on the top of the whole thing. So do, do you know what it is now? It's not no. No. This is for recreation. This is under the recreation heading, and this is the kind of recreation it was for. It's, it's the flame holder for opium pipe smoking. <laughs> you put the peanut oil in this reservoir, there's a little round disc with a hole in it that the uh, wick comes out of, and then that other globe thing goes over the top of that whole thing so that the fire is just at the top of that, and you put your opium pipe on there, it bubbles the opium and you breathe it in. Not bad, huh? And some of them were very, very fancy. We'll go back to that. Yeah, this is this goes on the top of the whole thing. And the flame is just right there, that spot, and you can just put put that opium pipe bowl right there. Uh, a lot of people think that this was a real problem drug, which is why it was made illegal in the United States. It was not made illegal in the United States because it was a problem drug. It was made illegal in the United States to get rid of the Chinese. Just like marijuana was made illegal in the United States to get rid of the hippies. <laughs> but I'm still here. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and actually, uh, opium isn't any more addictive than alcohol. Alcohol can be addictive. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you're an addictive person, yes, you will become addicted to opium. Uh, and it's a lot like alcohol. After smoking a bowlful of opium, you're very relaxed. You just as soon sit down and hang out rather than run around and do a bunch of stuff. After a hard day's work on the railroads or in a mine in Lake County, you might want to sit down and smoke a bowl of opium just to relax and get rid of those muscle aches and pains. Ah, this is what we're doing right now. That is Coburg's Resort. Example number three, the burned out remains of a Lake County resort. This is a concrete slab that is sitting on top of a cultural layer underneath here that was put there in 1936. Back in 1936, a fire burned through Cobb Mountain, just like the one we had two years ago. Yeah, and it burned 80 buildings at the Hoberts Resort. And when they were cleaning up from the 1936 fire, they decided to take all of that stuff and put it right here next to the lodge and use it as fill to build an addition on the lodge. So they put this concrete slab over it and <coughs> built the addition. Well, when this fire came through, 
the lodge was demolished, and we spotted this layer of cultural material coming out from under here. And it's a time capsule of everything that went on at Hoburg's Resort from 1890 to 1936. And we have been cleaning and sorting and cataloging this stuff for the past several months at the Eli Museum. <coughs> everything comes from that feature, so we know where it came from, we know the time period it represents, everything gets cleaned, then it goes into the museum where we sort through everything. And uh, this is the glass, it first gets sorted by color, because that's one of the ways to tell the time period. Uh, then we sort all the pieces out from each color that have writing on them, all the pieces that are necks, all the pieces that are bases that might have the maker's mark on the bottom. And uh, then all of that stuff goes into the computer, counted, weighed, and uh, goes into the database program. <clears throat> this is a bag here of, uh, you can tell that was kind of melted in a fire. <laughs> These are just the whole bottles, or mostly whole bottles, that have come out. And we've got this one that's kind of interesting. We're getting a lot of these. Heinz, honey and almond cream. Hmm. Oh. S.A. Heinz. Honey and almond cream. And I go, what the heck is this? You know, you know when you go to a hotel and they give you little things, you know, your shampoo and your, yeah. you know. I think this was in an, each room at Hoburg's back in the day. And, uh, and I thought, oh, well, it's honey and almond cream must have been for sunburns or something. But no, it's actually to cleanse the skin. And look, here we got some people going up to Hoburg's on this postcard, you know, which was an advertisement for this Heinz honey and almond cream. What? That's the kind of stuff that gets an archaeologist excited. What is the value of this? The value of this is what it told us about the people at Hoburg. That's what the value of this is. And after I'm finished talking, you are welcome to come up and go through these and see what you see. Oh, Listerine. <laughs> Everyone got a little bottle of Listerine in their room. You know, Hoburg's was one of the first all-inclusive resorts. Now we go to Cancun, right? We go, yeah, oh yeah, oh, so your, your booze is covered, your meals, everything's covered. When you went to Hoburg's, it was the same way. All your meals, you're there for a week, your horseback riding was taken care of. Anything you wanted to do, you wanted to go hunting, they would provide, whatever. So it was one of those first all-inclusive resorts. So learning about what went on there is absolutely fascinating. These are the bags of sorted materials that I have not cataloged into the computer yet. This is actually the blue glass, the uh, cobalt blue glass, sorted. Some of these things in here have the pieces with the names. What do we got here? Round glass. It's got something written on it. So you're welcome to come up and look at this stuff when I'm done. Do not take something out and put it in a different bag. Because <laughs> the volunteers have spent a lot of time sorting this into their individual categories. <coughs> so this is what we're doing right now. We're right in the middle of the project, piecing together the puzzle of the Hoburg's past based on the glass that we found, found there. So it's just one of many pieces that helps us to reconstruct the puzzle of the past. And in order to be able to use a piece, to help reconstruct the past, we have to know how old it is, its location, the context, what was it, where was it in the ground in association with everything else, and how was it used. So all of these things are necessary. If you miss, if you're missing any of this information, you can't use that as a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if you're an artifact collector, if you're glass. If you're a bottle collector, like I started out as when I was in junior high and high school, and you're out digging in an old dump, you're taking pieces of puzzle, of history puzzle, away. If that's not recorded where it came from, you may as well throw it away. 
It's worthless, absolutely worthless, from a scientific perspective, if you don't know where it came from. If you have a collection of bottles, put your hand up. I'm not going to take you to court. <laughs> if you have a collection of bottles, my advice to you is take your bottle and and make a little notepad and put a little stick a little thing on here. Look at this. See, this is uh, B81. All of my bottles that I collected it, as a bottle collector back in the day, I have cataloged. And I've got a notebook that says this came from here. So when I pass on and I give these to the local museum, that information will still be there. If you pass away and you didn't write that down and your grandkids get that stuff, totally worthless. Which is why the California Public Resources Code and the Federal Archaeological Resource Protection Act make it illegal to remove, deface, transport, or sell any historic or prehistoric artifact from a significant site. Just in case you needed to be reminded. I, as an archaeologist, I'm really not allowed to have artifacts. It's kind of like an Audubon Society person having a bunch of stuffed birds in their house. But, all of my stuff's cataloged, and it's going to a museum when I'm dead, or even before. Uh, so, yeah. If you want to know everything there is to know about historic bottles, how to date them, how to, you know, anything about them, this is the plate. Write this down. The Society for Historic Archaeology.org bottle index. Um, almost all the information that you saw in my presentation today is from this. And, uh, and they, do, they did an excellent job of putting all this stuff together. And this is where you can actually see a video, an old time video of the automatic bottle machine in action. You can also see an old time video of the blowers, the hinge mold blowing guys at work. So yeah, SHA.org bottle index. And uh, you're welcome to come up and look at any of this stuff. Um, I haven't even gone through this bag of Hoburg stuff yet, so I don't know what's in there. My sorters went through and pulled out all the whole ones and stuck them in that bag. Yeah? Um, so is this, when, when you say the bottle makers, were they regional so the people on the, on the East Coast would find similar to artifacts than what you found up here on the West Coast? Yeah. And Midwest and... Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, in the early days, most of the bottle makers were back in, in the Midwest in the east, although there were bottle manufacturers in California that made local soda bottles uh, for, for the local market. Um, there, was, uh, there were bottlers around the San Francisco Bay. In fact, one of the guys, uh, Macaulay, owned uh, <laughs> the St. Louis Bottle Works in Napa. <laughs> we were doing an archaeological project up here on the side of Mount St. Helena, and there was an old mine called the Corona Mine, and, and we started finding these old beer bottles, and they had actually etched in the glass Macaulay and somebody or other, St. Louis Bottle Company, and I'm going, what the heck? That's kind of weird. <laughs> um, turns out, he was the main distributor of, um, oh, what was that, Rainier Beer in this part of California. So he was making these bottles, and he made so much money making these bottles, he decided to invest it <coughs> by buying a mine <laughs> just over the border in Napa County. And uh, so his miners were drinking his beer. <laughs> I'm sure he brought it up in cases. Um, he later on went to start a mineral water company called Calso Water. Maybe you've heard of it. The Calso Spring, Water Spring, is over by where Hoberg's Resort is. And he and the Hoberg's had arguments and court settlements over who had access to the Calso Water Spring. So yeah, he in San Francisco he was quite a guy with Calso Water and this uh, other beer bottling thing. The mine didn't really pay out very much, so he went out of business. But I actually have 
uh, photocopied a letter that uh, uh, John Livermore had that was written right here in Middletown at the, at the big hotel on the hotel stationery that says, I've purchased the, uh, the mine for you and here's the information about it and all this. It was, you know, it's really neat. You know, on the letterhead is the best hotel, you know, the <laughs> Lake County house, you know, best hotel in Lake County, you know. So anyway, neat stuff. Thank you all for coming and I'll be here for all questions. Uh, different um, bottle makers, was there any interest in quality? Thank you so much, uh, John Parker, for coming to talk to us today. Is there competition? We do have